What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're gonna to be talking about pleural disease that includes pleural effusions and pneumothorax. Before we get started, if you guys like this video, it makes sense to you, please support us, and you can do that by hitting that like button. Comment down in the comment section, and if you can, subscribe. Also, really suggest go down in the description box below, there's a link to our website. On our website, we have a lot of other cool things that we offer. Great notes, great illustrations, we're making exam prep courses for those of you taking your exams, like the step one, the step two, the pants, etc. So check that out. Also, we got some great merchandise if you guys are interested as well. But let's start talking about pleural diseases. So pleural diseases, there is two that you guys have to be able to recognize. That's pleural effusions and pneumothorax. With a pleural effusion, the problem is fluid. So there's some type of fluid and there's an increased amount of it that's actually present with inside of the pleural space. So that's the space that's usually between the parietal and the visceral pleura. So again, lots of fluid. We'll talk about the types of fluid and get into a little bit more in the depths of that in a second, but this is the first concept to understand. Now when a patient comes in with a pleural effusion, they can present with a lot of different findings. Sometimes the most common one is they have like this sense of pain whenever they're taking a breath in and out. And that's sometimes what we refer to as pleuritic chest pain. So listen for that somewhere in the clinical vignette, that should tip you off to think about a pleural disease in general. So pleuritic chest pain can be pretty common. The other thing is if it gets pretty large and it compresses the lungs, it definitely can affect the patient being able to take a deep breath in. So watch out for dyspnea as well. That's another common feature. So those would be two big ones. But this is the one that I really want you to remember. Second thing is that if a patient comes in and they have all this fluid that's actually present within their pleural space, it can affect different types of physical exam findings. One of those is tactile fremitus. So that's one thing when you kind of put your hands over the back and you say, okay, hey, say 99, and your ability to be able to feel that on your hypothenar eminences is usually going to be reduced. And that's because there's this fluid that's altering that transmission. So you wanna watch out for a reduction in their tactile fremitus. The other thing is that if you go ahead and you percuss, so you take and you percuss over the different parts of the lungs, where the pleural effusion is, it's gonna be really, really dull because of that fluid there. So listen for dullness to percussion. That's another potential sign that there may be fluid present with inside of that area, okay? Or some type of consolidation of the lung tissue. So dullness, on percussion. The last thing here is that if you take an auscultate over the lungs, especially where that pleural effusion is, the lung sounds are gonna be really decreased. So listen for any kind of decreased breath sounds. These are usually some of the findings that are super suggestive of a pleural effusion, is again, decreasing tactile fremitus, increasing dullness on percussion, and decreasing breath sounds in combination with pleuritic chest pain. Now. We've gotten to the point of how these patients will present. Now the question is, is what's causing this fluid? Well, it depends on the type of effusion they have. Is it transudative or exudative? So transudative effusions are usually going to be effusions that contain lots of fluid, minimal amounts of protein, very little concepts of cells as well. So let's understand why that would happen. One of the etiologies, super, super common, probably gonna be one of the most common you'll see, is a patient who has congestive heart failure. When you have congestive heart failure, your cardiac output, whether it's systolic or diastolic, your cardiac output stinks. So you aren't able to get blood flow out of the heart. And if blood isn't getting out of the heart, where will it go? It'll back up into the left atrium, and then what happens is it backs up into the pulmonary veins. What happens to these patients, what's called pulmonary capillary wedge pressure? It increases. So if their pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, which is a surrogate of their left atrial pressure, if it's high, that means the pressure inside of these capillaries is high. So the hydrostatic pressure, the pressure that pushes things out of these capillaries is higher. And so things like water, other electrolytes, certain types of filtrates, very little amounts of proteins will leak into this area. So there's gonna be lots of plasma molecules here. Now, with that being said, you're gonna have some proteins, but it's going to be very little, and you may have another specific type of protein called LDH, but it's gonna be very, very little. So I want you to remember that. It's not gonna have a lot of proteins. It's not gonna have a lot of LDH. These are gonna be some of these components that are present inside of this pleural space. So this is the pleural space, this is the capillary, and this is part of that lung tissue. So we're just really zooming in to this area right here. Now, that's one problem, is the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is high, the ability or the pressure inside of these capillaries are high, they'll push things out into that pleural space. Lots of fluid, all right? So you're gonna have tons and tons of fluid, and that's usually gonna be things like water and electrolytes. But 
the fluid is going to be very small in proteins and small in LDH. These are usually markers of lung injury, inflammation, increased capillary permeability. Another reason this happens is patients have destruction or injury to the synthetic function of albumin, whether that's because of cirrhosis or they're losing albumin in their urine. And this could be in situations of nephrotic syndrome. So I want you to remember two particular diseases. One is cirrhosis, where you lose the synthetic function. You lose the ability to make albumin. So albumin is reduced inside of your bloodstream. The other disease is called nephrotic syndrome. And this is where they have injury to their podocytes. And they just pee, pee, pee out a ton of this albumin into their urine. So either way, the amount of albumin that's present within the bloodstream is reduced. What does albumin do in your bloodstream? It helps to keep water and certain things inside of the bloodstream. If you have less of it, what will happen? They won't stay in the bloodstream. And so unfortunately, the oncotic pressure reduces and it causes fluid to not remain into the bloodstream and instead go out here into this pleural space increasing the amount of fluid, but again, this fluid is going to be very poor in proteins and poor in LDH. The reason why is this should signify that there's truly no lung injury that's actually taking place here. There is no lung injury that's taking place here. And that's what these two things are kind of telling me. That there is a lot of fluid, but that fluid is not rich in proteins and LDH. If I come over to this next son of a gun here, this is exudative effusions. And exudative effusions, there's some type of lung injury or inflammation. And when I talk about this, I'm talking about the lung parenchyma and even some of the tiny little blood vessels in those area. They're injured or inflamed. So that's the problem here is there is a massive amount of lung injury. So we'll put lung injury, or we can even say not just lung injury, but lung inflammation or lung inflammation for whatever reason. Now, because of that lung injury or inflammation, this is usually going to trigger a cytokine pathway. So cytokines will be released. When that lung becomes injured and inflamed, you'll have lots of inflammatory cytokines. And what these inflammatory cytokines do is they cause your blood vessels to become dilated and really leaky. And if they're leaky, they're not gonna be very good at controlling what leaves the blood and enters into this pleural fluid. And so unfortunately, as a result, you have increased capillary leakage, and this will have no real good control of what leaves the blood and enters into that pleural space. And so as a result, you have things like proteins, fluid, um, LDH molecules, and even potentially if there's lots of inflammation, you can even have lots of white blood cells coming to the area. So what would I see here? I see lots of fluid, I see lots of proteins, lots of LDH, and potentially I might even see some immune system cells. So what am I gonna wanna watch out for? I'll see tons of proteins, tons of LDH, and maybe even some white blood cells, potentially. We'll kind of put a plus minus because it depends upon the etiology, but usually it's increased. So we'll actually put that. Usually for the most part, most diseases, it is increased. Increased amounts of LDH, increased amounts of proteins, and a massive, massive amount of fluid. Now, with all of that being said, since this stuff is leaking out into these spaces, and now I notice a difference here between the fluid consistency if there is a lot of proteins, LDH, and particularly white blood cells, that tells me that this is a surrogate for lung injury. Lung injury is actually occurring. And that is how I can use this as a diagnostic tool to tell me, oh, this could be an exudative effusion versus a transudative effusion. Question that I have to ask myself is what's causing the lung injury or parenchymal inflammation? There's so many things, and that's what makes it difficult. It could be things like pneumonia, which is extremely common. You know, pneumonia, you develop what's called a para-pneumonic effusion. That's so common. So here, let's actually write that, because I'd say that's probably out of all of them, the most common cause is what's called a para-pneumonic 
effusion. That's a very common cause. Another one could be things like tuberculosis, which is a, that's a really big one as well. Another one could be malignancy, so any kind of like lung cancer. Other particular scenarios could be autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases are really big ones that I would want you guys to remember. Trauma is another one. So what we can call like a hemothorax. Sometimes you may hear that term, a hemothorax. Let's actually write that down. Hemothorax. And then there could be some other random ones. So other random ones that come in there is sometimes, I think this is actually how I yield to remember, sometimes there's this lymphatic structure that actually runs right here. It's called the, they call it thoracic duct. Sometimes in certain scenarios you can hit that and it can cause that to accumulate some lymphatic fluid into the area. And we call that a chylothorax. So sometimes remember that this could actually be due to thoracic duct injury. And just remember this term called a chylothorax. There is rich in chylomicrons, which is rich in triglycerides that are present within that pleuric fluid. But these are the big reasons why the patient has lung injury or lung inflammation causing capillary leakage. That covers the effusions. Now what I need to do is let's take it to the next step and say, okay, we got a pneumothorax, we got air. We got lots of air that is present within the pleural cavity. Now the question then <laughs> comes up, similar to what we did with pleural effusions, what's the presentation? Again, there's injury in some way, shape, or form to the pleural, so pleuritic chest pain is a very, very common one. And again, if these get big enough, they can alter the, they can cause compression of the lung tissue, lead to atelectasis, and make it hard to breathe. So dyspnea is another common finding. On physical exam, you're gonna see a lot of the same stuff. Tactile frematis is gonna be reduced. So you're like, wow, these kind of sound the same, Zach. How am I supposed to be able to differentiate it? Well, here's one big thing. Dullness to percussion is significant for pleural effusions and consolidation of the lung tissue. Tympany is very specific in some ways, shape or form for pneumothorax. So look for tympany on percussion that's a little bit more suggestive of a pneumothorax. And the other thing is that they will have, again, decreased breath sounds. So a lot of these things kind of look the same, decreased tactile fremitus, increased tympany on percussion, and decreased breath sounds. Pleuritic chest pain, dyspnea, common findings. Question to ask is why is this air in the pleural cavity? Same way, why was the fluid in the pleural cavity? The reasons why is three particular processes primary spontaneous pneumothorax, secondary spontaneous pneumothorax, or trauma. What do I mean by primary spontaneous pneumothorax? I want you to remember this. In primary, there is no lung injury or disease. In secondary spontaneous pneumothorax, there is lung injury or disease. And that is super, super critical to understand the differences between these two. Now, we've gotten that out of the way. Lung injury is not present, or disease is not present in primary spontaneous pneumothorax. So what's the cause? Usually this is seen in patients who are very tall, thin, young, and are males. All right, so tall, thin, oh, what that would be like, uh, young, Again, what would that be like? That'd be nice. And uh, males. And another thing to add on is sometimes in the clinical vignettes, they love to mess with you and say, oh, what if the patient has a history of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or Marfan syndrome? That can be somewhat helpful. So I'll put a plus or minus if they have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or Marfan's. That does add some utility to, for the question to say, ooh, that also makes it very interesting and precarious for a primary spontaneous pneumothorax. Now, what happens with these patients is these tall, thin, young males with potential conditions like this, connective tissue diseases, is they form these like tiny little blebs at the apex. So we call these subpleural apical blebs. And it's just an unfortunate process that happens in these people, these like little blebs here. And sometimes for whatever reason, these things can rupture. And if they do, they pop, air can immediately leak from the lung tissue, 
right here into the actual pleural space. And there we go, air is now leaking in there. That's the reason that the patient can develop that. There should be air in the lung tissue. There should not be air present within the actual pleural space. And now air has the opportunity to enter. So there's one reason, tall, thin, young males, potential history of these with subpleural avicle blebs. That is the primary process that can occur here. With secondary spontaneous pneumothorax, it's patients with an underlying lung disease. And what I mean by this is you have to have somebody who has two, one of two things. One is their hyperinflated lungs. So with hyperinflation comes increased risk of boule and other types of weird structures. So with hyperinflation, you increase the risk of these things called boule or other things like blebs as well. And because of that, if you think about this, now if the lungs are super, super kind of like stretched to the max, there is a very, very high risk chance that they could actually pop and cause air to leak in. This is especially common in COPD, more particularly in the emphysematous patients. You can see it in the chronic bronchitis patients, but I would say it's extremely common in the emphysema patient. And another one would be the asthmatic patient, a severe asthmatic patient. So think about COPD, more particularly the emphysema type, and then think about asthma particularly your obstructive lung diseases, where they have a hard time getting air out, so they obstruct, pump up their airways, increase the risk of these processes. The other one is infections. Or some type, actually, let's actually rewrite this, necrosis. There's some type of lung necrosis. This could be from infections, and this could actually be from malignancies as well. But either way, there is something that is causing necrosis of the lung tissue, and if it necroses, that's an easy opportunity for this to rupture through into the pleural cavity, air enters, boom, there you go. You got a, you got a pneumothorax. So it's one of these two particular scenarios that I think is important for you guys to remember. It's either increased hyperinflation or it's increased lung necrosis, and that's the pro primary cause of their lung injury or disease. All right, we come to the last one, which is probably the easiest one. For trauma, it's super straightforward. You've injured, you've caused some type of, you lost the integrity, there was a pleural puncture, is usually one particular thing. So you punctured through the parietal pleura, through the visceral pleura, into the actual lung, and then caused an opportunity from right there, that puncture, for air to leak right in. Super straightforward, right? Nothing crazy. The things I would want you guys to remember from this from external sources would be any kind of needle or any sharp object. So I think trauma would obviously be a super common one. Um, a thoracentesis, which is when they try to go in and remove fluid from patients who have pleural effusions. And another one is central lines. This is extremely common in patients who get things like IJs or subclavian lines, and then they just are placed by inexperienced providers, or for whatever reason it occurs, they hit that pleura and cause a pleural puncture, that's enough right there. Another reason is you're driving so much air um, into the patient's lungs. So we call this like barotrauma. This is very common with mechanical ventilation where you're pushing just these insanely large volumes of air into a patient and, or uh, patients are taking, have what's called auto peep where they're, they're air trapping and they're getting their lungs a little bit bigger. So either way, it's very common to happen in patients who are on mechanical ventilation. But it doesn't matter if they have lung disease or if they don't have lung disease, the primary process here is that there's some traumatic event. It had nothing to do with their structure, nothing to do with their lungs. It's a process of trauma, whether it's external or whether it's coming from very high airway pressures. So again, this is usually seen in high airway pressures. All right, where you're just mashing air into the lungs. Usually like high peeps or high tidal volume strategies. These are the things that I want you guys to remember. Now we've talked about pleural diseases in a pretty good amount of detail. What I need you guys to understand is, okay, I can identify the causes, the pathophys, the clinical features. What happens if that pleural fluid is so big? What are the complications that can arise? And the next thing is, what if that pneumothorax is so big and it starts pushing on things, what are the complications that can arise? All right, my friends, so now we're gonna talk about the complications that can arise in patients who develop pleural diseases. So we'll start with pleural effusions. In this patient, they have a massive pleural effusion, right? And so what happens is their pleural fluid really is pretty high, 
and that actually starts increasing the pleural pressure. And when the pleural pressure rises, that will then start leading to some potential problems. So here's all this pleural fluid. That increase in pleural fluid will then increase the pleural pressure. And when the pleural pressure increases, guess what it's gonna start doing to the lung tissue? It's gonna start squeezing and compressing the lung tissue. So then as a result, you get lung compression. And whenever you compress the lungs, you can make those alveoli collapse. All right, and what do we call that whenever the alveoli collapse? This is called atelectasis. And so the result here is these patients can develop some pretty decent atelectasis. And sometimes we call this compression atelectasis, but we're just gonna call this atelectasis. Now, here's two alveoli, right? So we're just kind of zooming in on this particular area here and seeing what's affected whenever this complete lobe of the lung is being compressed. When that, lung of the lo when that lobe of the lung is being compressed, these alveoli start getting smaller. When they get smaller, now what you do is you alter the ventilation. You lead to the patient not getting an adequate amount of ventilation to this alveoli and to this alveoli. So there is a reduction in the ventilation process, even though the perfusion process, blood flowing through these pulmonary capillaries, is completely normal. But whenever the ventilation is thrown off, you develop something called a VQ mismatch. So as a result, you get something called a VQ mismatch, where there is a reduction in the ventilation. We call this a low VQ mismatch. There's a reduction in the ventilation, but a normal perfusion. Now, if there's decreased ventilation, that means that decreased oxygen is moving here across the alveoli. Now, if decreased oxygen is moving across the alveoli and in response to this, then the patient will develop things like hypoxemia. That's a potential complication if there is a massive atelectasis. So the more the atelectasis, the more the VQ mismatch will be stimulated. And the more hypoxemia will ensue. Now, if this happens where the patient develops something like hypoxemia, this is an example of a type one respiratory failure. This is what can potentially result here, where the O2 is relatively reduced and then the CO2 is somewhat normal or maybe even decreased. Now, when these patients become hypoxemic, it's because the lungs are being collapsed and compressed. But imagine how that's gonna actually cause problems. You're gonna want to try to take in these deeper breaths to hopefully properly ventilate that alveoli. And so other features that may become super prominent in these patients is that in response to this hypoxemia, they may increase their respiratory rate, they may increase their work of breathing as a response to this. And so you really wanna watch out for this. This could be signs of respiratory failure or respiratory distress. So again, big things to understand is a potential complication of pleural effusions. Very large pleural effusions can increase pleural pressure, compress the lungs, cause atelectasis, cause VQ mismatch, cause this hypoventilation of the alveoli now. Now less oxygen comes across, hypoxemia can then precipitate an increase in respiratory rate and an increase in the work of breathing. If these patients are breathing really fast and working really hard to breathe, sometimes they'll blow their CO2 off. And so you may see signs of respiratory alkalosis. But this is the big thing to consider here. The other concept that is really big, and you need to remember this for pleural effusions, is they can develop these things called empyemas. This is extremely, extremely common in patients who develop pneumonia. So let's say here a patient develops a left lobar pneumonia. When they develop that left lower lobe pneumonia, that infection of the lung parenchyma will cause increased capillary leakage. Fluid will then start leaking into this pleural space. So then we develop, what did we call that before? What was this called? A paranemonic effusion. But let's be a little bit more specific. We're gonna call this a uncomplicated paranemonic effusion. So this is a uncomplicated, this is pretty much a normal exudative effusion. Uncomplicated paranemonic effusion. But then what happens is the infection continues and it spreads. So now, the infection that's right here, some of the bacteria begin to leak out of those capillaries as well, and some of the white blood cells. And so now you have the opportunity for some bacteria to be combined 
with that fluid. And again, just to remind yourselves, what is that fluid going to be really, really rich in? Rich in proteins and rich in LDLs. But it's also going to have some white blood cells in the area. So now at this point, we have a patient with what we call a complicated paranemonic fusion because now there's some bacteria in there. There's lots of white cells in the area. Sometimes the pH and the glucose can drop here as well. But then we get to the worst case scenario. We get to the point where this infection that's actually within this left lower lobe, it spread over, caused that uncomplicated paranemonic fusion, which then progressed to a complicated paranemonic fusion. But now, some of the bacteria, they spread out here, and they start to organize. And when they organize, they cause lots of white blood cells to come to the area, lots of inflammation to come to the area. And then what they begin to do, let's actually use, here, let's do this black color here. They begin to cause a fibrotic shell to form around it and become super loculated. So now you have this loculated effusion here, which is just literally filled with pus. It's bacteria, dead cells, white blood cells. This is now what we call a empyema. This is now a empyema. Empyemas are potentially dangerous. And the reason why is, one is you want to look for a patient who maybe had a pneumonia and they continue to have persistent fever. So look for patients with very high fevers, maybe a continuously increased white blood cell count, or a patient who appears to be septic, right? So they appear to be septic. In these scenarios, an empyema definitely can precipitate these types of features, is high fevers, high white blood cell count, and they can stimulate sepsis. Because what happens is this bacteria can spread into the bloodstream and cause systemic bacterial infections. But what you're gonna notice is this is the progression, where a patient can start off with pneumonia that begins with an uncomplicated paranemonic effusion. The difference here is the bacteria begin to kind of jump in. Right? The bacteria begin to jump into the fluid, and so do white blood cells. And then you go from a complicated perineumonic effusion to a empyema, and this is where you begin to form frank pus and loculations. And that's usually the key terminology that you guys want to be able to understand between these guys. But this is the complications that can arise in these patients. Is you can start off with just a little bit of fluid there that's rich in protein, having some cells, but then bacteria can spread into the area, cause it to become an infected fluid, and then that fluid can become very purulent and frankly pus-containing with loculations and fibrotic material around it. And that can cause these persistently high fevers, persistently high white counts, and potentially precipitate sepsis. Usually a patient has pneumonia, they get treated for the pneumonia, Maybe the pneumonia continues, though, to cause these effusions, and those effusions grow into an empyema. They'll have, again, a recurrence of their symptoms, and that's usually going to make you cue in to think about an empyema. All right, now that we've talked about pleural effusions, let's now come down and start talking about the next complication, which is pneumothorax. When a patient develops a pneumothorax, the problem is, is that they got a lot of air inside of that pleural cavity. We already talked about the reasons for it. When you have a bunch of air, so there's an increase in the air in the pleural space, right? Now, naturally, let's actually be very, very specific here. There shouldn't be air in the pleural space. There shouldn't be. So any presence of air in the pleural space is considered to be a pneumothorax. It should just be a little bit of fluid. But if for whatever reason you decide to build up some air, I'm just going to put an increased air in front of it because, again, it's, you have air present within the pleural space. The more air present in the pleural space, the more the pressure inside of that pleural space will increase. So now this patient can have an increase in their pleural pressure. If you have an increase in their pleural pressure, this should start to look very familiar as compared to above. What would that do to parts of the lung right here? Air is rising, in the, air, the pressure here is rising, it's pushing, pushing on this lung area, it's pushing on the lobe, it's compressing it. What's it gonna do? it's going to cause lung compression. That lung compression, if it's on a particular area, in this example, the right lower lobe, what's it gonna to do to the alveoli making up that right lower lobe? Collapse them. What's that collapse called? Atelectasis. What does atelectasis do? It leads to VQ mismatch. And that can lead to hypoxemia. So the more air in the pleural space, the more the pleural pressure rises, the more lung compression you'll experience, 
the more atelectasis and you will stimulate this VQ mismatch to ensue. Now, when this happens, think about this. These should normally be normal healthy alveoli. I'm taking this section here of where this compression is and I'm zooming in on it. This is being super compressed. All of this is now air. Up here, it was pleural fluid. So these are being smashed down. If these are being smashed down, now they're tiny little alveoli and I can't bring air in to these alveoli properly. So there is a reduction in the ventilation and therefore normal perfusion. So that's the VQ mismatch. If I reduce this, now what's gonna to happen to the oxygen or gas exchange across this area? It's going to be reduced. If I don't exchange gases properly, especially oxygen, what will be the precipitating result here? The patient will have low blood oxygen levels, which is called hypoxemia. And if the patient has hypoxemia, so their SpO2 drops or their PaO2 drops, what can that lead to? That'll cause the patient to feel like they're short of breath, so they'll have to work a little bit harder to breathe, and they will breathe harder and faster. And so this can look one of two ways. Their respiratory rate can go up, if it allows, and their work of breathing, the use of accessory muscles, like nasal flaring, intercostal retractions, belly breathing, all of those things will occur. If the patient breathes fast and deep enough, they will expel tons of CO2 and precipitate a respiratory alkalosis, which is also common in these scenarios. But again, respiratory failure is common in both of these pleural diseases. What's a big differentiating factor here is what's called a tension pneumothorax. And this is the scary thing that you can't miss on the step two. It'll be blaring to you. It'll literally be super obvious. Patient has air in their pleural cavity, right? So the pleural pressure is through the roof because of this, right? So there's tons and tons of pleural pressure in here. And because of that, the lung is being significantly compressed. What really is the big thing here is a tension pneumothorax can occur because of a primary spontaneous pneumothorax, a secondary spontaneous pneumothorax, but it's very common with a traumatic pneumothorax. Let me explain how this happens. Let's take this piece of lung right here, this area here, and zoom in on it. I'm just zooming in on this portion right here. What happens is during inspiration, regardless of the cause of the pneumothorax, it doesn't matter. Air will enter into the lungs, and then what happens is you have this break in the parenchyma and the visceral pleura. There's the break. That cr creates an opportunity for air to enter right into the pleural cavity. Boom, air's in there. During expiration, for some weird reason, you create this thing called a one-way valve where air can enter, so this could open up. But during expiration, somehow these, this break within the pleura and the lung parenchyma re-comes back together, it, it collapses together. So now air won't be able to enter back into the lung and it'll stay in the lung. So air can enter, can't exit. That is a recipe for disaster because you know what it's gonna do? It's gonna keep all this air which I'm representing here in blue, a lot can come in and none can go out. That is going to massively, massively, massively increase the pleural pressure. If the pleural pressure rises, it'll start squeezing in the lungs, which you'll see the respiratory failure, but you know what else you'll see? You'll see compression of other things inside of the mediastinum. So what it'll start doing is, imagine here, I have all this air and it's pressing on the lungs. As it presses, there's only so much lung you can compress that it actually starts shifting everything in the mediastinum to the opposite side. So now I'm gonna shift the trachea to the opposite side. I'm gonna start squeezing on the right heart. Now what's that gonna look like? You're gonna get a couple effects out of this. One is if I shift the trachea, it'll have tracheal deviation. Examine that, look to see if their trachea appears to be deviated on exam or chest x-ray. So tracheal deviation is really big, okay? And that's because of this crazy high intrapleural pressure. All right, so that's one thing that can happen here. So we're gonna bring this down to stimulate this whole pathway that we're gonna talk about here. This is high enough that it's boom, pushing the trachea to the opposite side. The other thing is it's gonna compress the right heart. If you compress the right heart, what's the right heart supposed to do? Bring blood into it. It's good for venous return. But now, if it's being compressed, are you gonna have good venous return? No. So venous return is impaired. So they have what's called a reduction in their diastolic filling. So whenever the heart's supposed to relax, you're supposed to get a lot of blood coming into it.
but it's not going to. If you reduce diastolic filling, blood is going to back up from the right atrium, remember your anatomy, to the superior vena cava, up to the brachiocephalus, up to the jugular veins. And the blood is going to pump these suckers up. And what's a common finding that you will see? You will see something called jugular venous distension. That's one potential finding, right? So you'll see a finding of jugular venous distension. The other thing is, if you can't fill the ventricles, that reduces your preload. If you reduce your preload, what do you do to your stroke volume? You drop it. What do you do to your cardiac output? You drop it. What do you do to your cardiac output? If your cardiac output drops, what happens to your blood pressure? That drops. So they'll have a drop in cardiac output, which will lead to a drop in their blood pressure. What's that call when your blood pressure is low? Hypotension. So one finding here that we're already seeing is the patient can have hypotension, jugular venous distension, tracheal deviation, all because of the pleural pressure being so high that it's causing what's called a mass effect or mediastinal shift. All of these things are occurring because of that high intrapleural pressure. The other thing is, take a second, listen to the lungs. What would you not hear very well on that side? Breath sounds. So if I have a patient with absent or decreased breath sounds, tracheal deviation, hypotension, and jugular venous distension, what could it be? A tension pneumothorax. You don't get a chest x-ray, you put a chest tube in right away, or at least decompress them. All right, we've now identified the pleural diseases. Now we have to diagnose these, which is how do we diagnose just a pleural effusion? I want to find it. I can easily find it by getting a chest x-ray. Look at that meniscus sign we call here, which is usually pretty indicative of what we call a pleural effusion here on that right hemithorax. I could also do a chest CT. This is a really good one. You can see here they have a left pleural effusion, and maybe even like some associated like air bronchograms. They might have an ammonia. So that gets really good at being able to identify complications like empyemas potentially. So that's one of the great things I like about that. But the best test I'd say to start off with really differentiating if it's transitative or exudative is a thoracentesis. So you find the actual pleural effusion, you tap into the pleural effusion with a needle, and if you tap into this pleural effusion, it's going to suck some of that fluid off and then they're going to go test it. And what you're testing it for is you're testing it for color. So does it look clear? Pleural protein, is there very little of it? Is there very little pleural LDH? This usually tells me that the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is low. This usually tells me that there's low oncotic pressure and that this is more transudative in appearance. In the other scenario, let's say that it looks cloudy. Let's say that the protein is really high. And let's say that the LDH is high. This is more suggestive of lung injury, and this would be more suggestive of an exudative effusion. So then what do I do? Okay, well, if I think it's a transudative effusion, I gotta think about the causes. Most likely it's CHF from an elevated pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Or it's cirrhosis and nephrotic syndrome from low albumin levels, causing low oncotic pressure. From the exudative effusion, I wanna obtain a pleural glucose. This may seem odd, but when you obtain a pleural glucose, it really helps you to delineate the types of things that can cause this. Because we talked about pneumonia, particularly parenemonic effusions, and one of the nastiest ones is empyema. We talked about uh, tuberculosis. We talked about malignancy and autoimmune diseases and pancreatitis and all those things. If I get a pleural glucose, this is really helpful. The reason why is if it's normal, it tells me three things. It's either a chylothorax because of high triglycerides if I tested that. It's usually indicative of a hemothorax by lots of red blood cells and history of trauma, or it's usually a pancreatitis or esophageal rupture if there's lots of amylase. And again, a normal pleural glucose. If the pleural glucose is low, there's only a couple different causes. And I remember the mnemonic of this by meat. And now I'm gonna go through this. One is if the acid fast bacillus stain is positive, it's more suggestive of tuberculosis. If they have an ANA or rheumatoid factor that's positive, it's more suggestive of an autoimmune disease. If the cultures are positive and they have a really low pleural pH, that's more suggestive of an empyema or an, a complicated parenemonic effusion. And lastly, if there's abnormal cytology and maybe lots of blood or red blood cells, that could be suggestive of malignancy, usually grade four at that point. But you can remember this mnemonic of low pleural glucose is by meat, malignancy, empyema, autoimmune, and tuberculosis. And that's actually kind of helpful. But again, I think the biggest thing to take away from this for your boards is what's the lights criteria? This is the criteria that we use to determine if it's likely transudative and exudative, and then we can go down the chain that we just discussed. If there's lots of pleural protein, and we say that by if you compare the serum pr uh, protein to the pleural protein, if the ratio is greater than 0.5, that's suggestive of an exudative. 
if the amount of LDH in the pleural fluid in comparison to the serum LDH is greater than 0.6, that's suggestive of an exudative effusion. And if the pleural LDH is greater than two thirds, the upper limit of normal of the serum LDH, it's suggestive of an exudative effusion. If none of these are present, it's likely transudative. And the most common transudative one is CHF. So with that being said, if I have a patient who I go through, I finally have an exudative effusion, I go through and it has a low pleural glucose, maybe there's lots of white blood cells, and I'm trying to determine if this is this uncomplicated, complicated, or empyema. How would I go about that? When I analyze that pleural fluid, if it looks slightly cloudy, that could be uncomplicated, but if it looks really cloudy, that's probably complicated, and if it looks purulent or pus-containing, it's likely an empyema. That's one way. The next one is, look at all those things we just talked about. What's the pleural pH? If it's high, or at least greater than 7.2, it's more uncomplicated. But if it's less than 7.2, it could be complicated or an empyema. What's the glucose? If it's relatively normal, that's uncomplicated. But if it's low, it's complicated or an empyema. And then lastly, look at the pleural white blood cell. Is it less than 50K? All right, it's uncomplicated, but if it's greater than 50K, it's likely complicated or empyema. So I'm still having difficulty. I'm only being able to differentiate these by appearance right now. Okay, is there any other ways? All right, well, I could get cultures. If the cultures come back negative, that means bacteria haven't invaded into the world space yet. If cultures are positive, it probably means that bacteria have invaded into the space. Again, not super helpful here. All right, is there another way? What if I get imaging? I get a chest CT. And off that, I see no loculations. Now I see that this is more likely uncomplicated or complicated. And if it comes back loculated, it's more likely an empyema. With that being said, if it's uncomplicated, it's usually just antibiotics. If it's complicated or an empyema, it's usually antibiotics and giving them a chest tube. All right, that leads us right into the next step. How do we treat pleural effusions? Well, it's really treating the underlying cause, but if a patient's in respiratory distress because of their pleural effusion, it's probably best to do a thoracentesis and actually to pull that fluid off because it won't be causing as much atelectasis and unfortunately respiratory failure. So if we can do that and then treat the underlying cause, that would be the best thing. The other concept is when do I put in an indwelling pleural catheter? It stays in there. It's not just a one-time tap and done. Usually this is happening if I'm performing multiple thoracentesis, particularly if the patient has malignant related pleural effusions, and you can just let that indwell in there and continue to drain. So that's a nice thing for that. The other one is I'd do a chest tube. In what circumstances would I do a tube thoracostomy where I would actually insert in the chest tube in the fourth intercostal space, usually anterior axillary line? It's usually if they have an empyema, like a loculated, nice, nasty-like thing. That's gonna be one reason, or they have a big fluid accumulation of blood, like a hemothorax. All right, any other reasons would not be necessary for a pleural effusion. If they have failed to respond to antibiotics, and they have failed to respond to a chest tube, uh, and usually even TPA that gets put into the chest tube drain to really break up the empyema, then sometimes they may require surgery where they get what's called a video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery. And that would be for like a refractory empyema. The last thing here is what's called a pleurodesis, or a chemical or mechanical pleurodesis. You can either go in surgically and rub against the pleural layers and cause it to obliterate and lose the space, um, or you can put in drugs like doxycycline or talc. And what that does is that kind of creates a little fibrotic reaction, and then this will obliterate the actual pleural space. So you can't form any effusions anymore. And that's for patients who have refractory malignant effusions, usually malignant again. That's the big thing. All right, so that's how we would treat pleural effusions. But again, I think it's the most important thing to remember is that you have to treat the underlying cause because if you don't, the effusion will just reaccumulate. So again, I think it's a big example here is that in patients who have um, transudative effusions secondary to CHF, you can do a thoracentesis if they're in overt respiratory failure. But if you don't continue to dereese them and treat their underlying disease, it'll reaccumulate. So that's oftentimes a really important thing to remember. Now we move into the diagnostic approach. So you have to ask yourself the question always, what's the scariest pneumothorax tension? Do they have one? Okay, they do. You better grab that needle, decompress them, shove a chest tube in, because this patient can die if you don't. If they don't have that, then you want to go looking for other things. Again, it's not a tension pneumothorax. It could be any type of pneumothorax, as long as it's not a tension. So get a chest x-ray. You'll be able to see right away, oh, there's no lung markings here. And there's the, you can actually see the pleural line right there. In this scenario here, same thing. You can see there's absence of lung markings here and that the lung is like, there it is right there. There's your pleural line right there. So you can definitely see and identify that this patient has a pneumothorax by the absence of lung markings. If you really wanted to go the next step and say, what's the cause? You really could evaluate if they have underlying lung disease, but oftentimes the history is usually the key. Um, if a patient just was in a traumatic incident, they just had a central line placed, um, they just had a thoracentesis done, 
they were on the mechanical ventilator, um, they have no underlying history of lung disease, or they have a history of COPD or something to that effect, you can do that. But if you want to look, you can get a chest CT, and this may be able to show you some boule or some emphysematous findings, which could suggest like a secondary spontaneous pneumothorax. But again, it's just another way of finding the pneumothorax. Once you've found the pneumothorax, you have to treat these patients. And one of the best things to do is say, okay, is it big enough that they're not going to resolve on their own and the patient could progress and get worse? If it's not, and it's less than two centimeters from the chest wall to the actual pleural line, you can just observe, watch them, see if it goes away on its own. Oftentimes giving them oxygen to pull nitrogen from that space can help and getting serial chest x-rays to see if it gets bigger or watching them to see if they develop any worsening symptoms like respiratory failure. If it gets bigger, greater than two centimeters, or they exhibit any signs of respiratory failure, you need to put a chest tube in, fourth intercostal space, anterior axillary line. And then if they develop a tension, it's automatic needle decompression, and then chest tube. All right, my friends, so now let's move on to the next step here, which is discussing a little bit more information about chest tubes. So you may experience a question or two, but you may experience this more in your clinical clerkships. So let's talk a little bit about this. So we have this chest tube in, right? And there's many different reasons. We've already talked about a couple. One is a patient has particularly a type of effusion that is exudative in nature, like an empyema or a hemothorax. That would be one indication for a chest tube. The second one is they have a pneumothorax and you're trying to drain either fluid or air of some sort out of the actual pleural cavity. Now what you do is you have the tube going into the actual pleural cavity. Now if it ha comes from the patient, the first thing it does is it empties into this type of component here called the chest tube. Like this is usually what we use called Pleurovax or Oasis um, and these are different types of chest tube kind of setups. Now, this is gonna be the tube coming from the patient delivering blood or delivering pus or delivering air. And then there's gonna be another thing that we'll talk about a little bit later, which is a tube that can go towards the suction on the wall. Now, this is the suction control. The suction control is basically what you set for the actual degree of suction for the chest tube. So for example, you could set the wall suction to like, I don't know, 22,000 centimeters you know, per of water, it won't matter. The suction control on the chest tube is what you usually generate, and that's usually set to negative 20. Here's just the manometer, which kind of just gives you an idea of that. This is called the suction control chamber, and we'll talk about the three bottle system. Again, this is the chamber that is usually filled with a little bit of water and wet vacs, and that degree and the amount of water that you have determines the amount of suction that you're gonna be able to generate. You also have what's called a water seal chamber. It's exactly what it sounds like. It seals off air so that it, it prevents air from kind of leaking back into the collection chamber and then back into the actual patient's pleural cavity. So it seals off the actual air and prevents it from going backwards, thus the name water seal. And then we have this thing called the collection chamber and it's literally what it says. It collects things like, for example, blood if it's a hemothorax, chyle if it's a chylothorax, pus if it's an empyema. And again, that's the whole point of that. Now, when we talk about this, we talked about three particular chambers, the collection chamber, the water seal, and then the suction control chamber. Now, when we take these and look at them individually, we use this three bottle system, if you will, but this three bottle system is built into one specific thing called a pleurovac or an oasis. So this is gonna be the tube coming from the patient. And what it'll do is it'll deliver everything. It'll deliver fluid. If there is any fluid in the actual pleural cavity, this could be blood, this could be pus, this could be air, et cetera. And it'll deliver it into the collection bottle. There's going to be a tube that comes out of the collection bottle and moves things over into the water seal chamber. So this part is where blood and fluids and all that stuff stay. They don't move over into the next chamber. If there's any air that's present inside of the patient's chest, it'll move via the collection bottle over in to the water seal chamber. When it moves into the water seal chamber, the air will then actually move into the water and bubble. And basically the whole point of this is that this air that actually gets into this water seal chamber, it kind of dissolves and it kind of moves out into this kind of chamber and prevents it from being able to move backwards towards the collection bottle. And that's what's really cool about this one. Now, generally whenever a patient has a chest tube, we can use this concept called a two bottle system. In other words, if a patient has a pneumothorax or they have a little bit of an effusion, you can actually set this thing to water seal. And essentially what that means is fluid will drain out of the chest into the collection bottle. If there is any air, it'll move into this actual water seal chamber and that's it. It won't move any further. There's not going to be any suction that's generated against the actual pleural cavity to suck more air out. So sometimes this is what we call setting the chest tube to water seal.
We'll talk a little bit more about that, but there's specific things that you should be monitoring for in the actual water seal chamber. But let's say that the patient does have a really big pneumothorax and it's not gonna be able to completely kind of resolve what, by putting them to water seal. You need to generate suction to really cause those two layers of the pleura to come together and kind of become opposed again. And so sometimes in order to do that, you need to generate enough kind of suction or pressure to really kind of suck the actual two layers back together. So what we'll do is, is sometimes we'll actually have again air moving via this third tube into this third bottle called the suction bottle. And again, this is usually filled with water. There's two tubes that are actually coming into this suction bottle. One is a tube that kind of comes from the atmosphere. And what this does is this allows air to come into the actual suction bottle and again, help with being able to regulate the pressure that can be generated from the suction control chamber. It's kind of like the regulator, if you will. The third one is the actual tube that'll come out of the suction bottle and go to the wall suction. So that's the concept here, is that you can set a degree of suction or pressure that you wanna pull air out of the actual chest, but it's regulated by this vent and the degree or the amount of water that's present in this suction bottle, all right? Which is very important to prevent injury to the lungs. Again, usually the suction control is set to 20 centimeters. And again, let's talk now about this three bottle systems and things that you should be monitoring for. Again, the collection chamber is collecting fluid, so you really wanna look and see. If they had an empyema and it's not putting out enough, enough output, you need to consider, okay, maybe I have to instill some TPA, maybe they need a VATS. So that's important to be watching out for. If they have a hemothorax and they're putting out a ton of blood, this is very concerning, and this may mean that you have some vascular bleeding that you have to take them back to the OR and figure out. Same thing, I told you the water seal chamber, which is this one, which is where air should bubble. If there's lots of bubbles, that means that there's a potential two things. One is that the patient still has a pneumothorax and air is leaking from their chest into the collection bottle into the water seal chamber. Or if they don't have a pneumothorax, there's air that's leaking into the tubing somewhere along the process of the chest tube. And you have to evaluate for that. All right. Usually a chest x-ray to rule out pneumothorax, good position of the actual chest tube, and then kind of evaluating the tubing system along the way. The other thing that you should be watching out for, and sometimes we'll hear, is that the patient ex exhibits in their water cell chamber titling, which shows that the fluid is moving up and down. And that's usually just the changes in intrapleural pressure. Whenever a patient breathes, they generate a pressure that can help to pull that fluid up the actual water seal chamber tubing. And then whenever they exhale, it comes back down. But that's normal with breathing. What you wanna watch out for is if it's not titling, that could mean a couple different things. If it's not titling, it could mean that there's like a, potentially a kink within the tubing or the tubing is occluded of some sort. So that's something to be able to watch out for. The last one is the suction chamber. So the suction chamber, again, you set a particular pressure off the suction control. You can generate wall suction, but that's not the important thing. It's the degree of pressure that you set the actual suction control chamber to that's important. So if you get a little bit of bubbles, that's normal. You want to have bubbles that's indicating that you're having appropriate amount of suction that's generated from the suction control chamber. But if you're having excessive amounts of bubbles, that means that the suction is too excessive and you need to turn that down because what can happen is it can actually cause kind of the chest tube to suck on the lung. If you already kind of obliterated that space and you resolved the pneumothorax, now it's just gonna suck on lung and kind of cause more injury. So that's something to watch out for. All right, my friends, I hope that made sense. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. And as always, until next time.